Every great city has its tales, and I've been documenting their stories and people for over 20 years. This is Tales of a City. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Tales of a City. Recently, I had the chance to sit down with a true Australian music industry legend, Doug Ashdown. Now, Doug was the composer and performer of one of Australia's most iconic songs, Winter in America, as well as many, many other songs. Now, before we uh, sit down to chat with Doug, let's have a look at Winter in America. The hall is misty in the morning, love. Oh, how I miss December. The French a penny opens up to kiss the salty air. I know you're getting ready for the office. I suppose he's still there with you. Winter in America is cold And I just keep growing older I wish I could have known Enough of love To leave love enough I've learned something of love I wish I'd known before you left me But it's funny how you don't know what you've got until it's gone And I hope you're getting all the love you've ever wanted But I wish I was there Sadness of the rain and making love to strangers and wishing I had known enough of love to leave love enough. Doug, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Um, you've had a very long and varied career, but I must tell you how you actually touched my life. Yeah. Um, in 1977, I bought a Polystar Australian music compilation record called Scorcher, and on there was Winter in America, your oh, song. Oh, the top 20 hit kind of thing. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. It was a fabulous song and deeply touched me. I, it was the year that yeah. I was starting to become aware of music uh -huh. and what it meant and how it could affect you. And that song actually was very meaningful to me. I quite, right. It touched me. I don't know why I was quite young. And it seems that it was a song about loss. Would that be right? Yeah, I guess it would be because um, I could tell you the story Please of, of Winter in America. We, uh, Jimmy Stewart, myself and Carol, we were living in Nashville. We had a publishing contract in Nashville in mm. 
1971 to 73, and about I think it would be probably early 72. It was uh, we the, they actually got um, snow in right. Nashville, which was just <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, not very often do you get snow in Nashville. And uh, we were writing, we you know, we were writing quite a few songs for, for Tree Publishing, which we'd got a contract with. And um, Jimmy had this idea for Leave Love Enough Alone. He sort of thought it was a play on words, mm. you know. And I had Winter in America is Cold, and I just kept going, Ola, I had that sort of idea going. And we were going to write two songs with those titles. And uh, we ended up deciding to write the one song, and they melded you know, together the chorus and the, uh, and the lead Would that be why uh, I noticed that on some of the record releases it was titled Winter in America and in brackets, well, Leave Love I could give you the, I'll give you the story of that in a minute. Mm. Um, some friends of ours had asked to see some brochures of Australia. Oh, right. And we'd already been there for over a year, you know. And, uh, of course, communications were not like they are now with internet and, you know, like mm. my... You know, Instant communication. Yeah. You'd have to write a letter. And that. So you kind of got homesick. And people wanted to see these brochures, and we got them. And there was photos of Sydney Harbour and koalas and all that stuff, and it made us homesick. So we started to write, you know, Frangipani opens up and all that. You know, it was about Sydney and mm. missing Sydney, and because we lived in Sydney at the time uh, before we left for America. and. Um, so that's really how it came about, the song, and mm. uh, it, uh, it sort of stayed there really for till we got back to Australia and I recorded it. So um, it was very orchestral. Well, I wrote that uh, I wrote that little thing at the start mm -hmm. on guitar, and when we had the record done, I asked my arranger of the song Wayne Finlay to if to write like a Mahler's symphonic kind of thing. At, you know, introduction. introduction. Mm. Australia, they left that off. Yes, I noticed. And uh, it didn't do anything. Leave Love Enough Alone, no, it didn't do anything. Now, there was a DJ in Sydney called Bob Rogers, and he suggested that we change the title and get them to re release it as Winter in America because people would not understand. They'd be going in the shop, you got that Winter in America song. So uh, that's what they did. They put it out again as a single and an album, called it, called it Winter in America, and it took off. And it's become, it's, it's beca it wasn't a really huge hit, you know. When but you it say, has become a perennial It's become a, a, a kind of a classic song now. And mm. uh, I've written dozens and dozens of songs and that one is sort of, you know, the song. It's what I'm known for. And um, luckily, uh, later on, it was recorded by a Dutch singer mm. called René Froger. And René Froger took, took it at the top of the charts in Holland and it became his signature tune. So it's done really well over 50 or 45 years, you know. I'm surprised that at the time when you wrote it, so it was around 73 or so. 72, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it was, you know, we're talking the disco era and a landscape of rock. Yeah, yeah. True. Mind you, he had just come out of the 60s, so there still would have yeah, been that interesting and, and we were in Nashville, of course, so right. that was a country music city, you know. And yeah. uh, although we weren't really writing country music, we wrote a few, but there was one actually that was a hit for us there called Just Thank Me, which was a country song we wrote for David Rogers, and uh, it was basically the only hit he had. And um, that really did well. Mm. And we wrote a lot of other songs, but um, that one song, you, we never knew at the time that it would be, you know, what it is mm. now because it was just another song. Mm. 
And um, it's it's amazing how it's become that ingrained, you know. It certainly is. It's yeah. part of Australia's culture now. I know. It's, it's wonderful. It's great. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> no. Now, um, speaking of the 70s, um, you had quite a look going on back then. Um, I, I managed to find some photographs. They were, um, it was quite a look. You were a symphony in brown. Oh, my God. <laughs> but I think everybody in the 70s then were. I mean, here's... Uh, There's probably a, the, the album Empty Without You's got that. that uh, yes, that's a very the good one. example. Yes. yes, that's the Empty Without You cover. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, I know that was taken at the Sydney Opera House, actually. Indeed, um, the film clip. That's actually from the film clip for um, Winter in America. What happened when uh, they released my version of it in Holland in mm -hmm. 1978? And uh, I got this phone call and said, uh, we want you to come to Holland to do the Top of the Pops. Yes. And I thought, well, we'll just send them a, a film clip, you know, that's what mm. you normally do, just send them the, the video, you know. But they, they, they said, no, there's two tickets waiting for you at KLM, you know. And I said, oh, someone's having a lend of me here. <laughs> but I rang up KLM and there was two tickets to, to Amsterdam for Jimmy Stewart and myself. So we hopped on the plane and we, 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 we lobbed in Amsterdam. We got met by a guy <laughs> at Sadie's Benz, driven to a great hotel. I did a TV show and a couple of little interviews and a small concert. And it was about a day and a half. And I got back on the plane and came back to Australia. <laughs> and I spent like a day and a half, two days in Amsterdam. Mm. And they wouldn't take a film clip. They flew us over there for free. And um, you also have another connection to my life, bizarrely. You um, wrote four songs for the movie soundtrack of Billy's Holiday. That's right. Or co-wrote, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. A, a very good friend of mine um, was in that, uh, worked on that film, Ronnie Arnold, who is the choreographer. Oh, okay. Bl yeah. Black American gay man. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, fabulous. Guy. I didn't have much to do with the film itself. Yeah. You know, I, like Jimmy and I and a couple of other people wrote, um, wrote a few songs for it. It, well, it, I believe it won some awards for it its won, um, I think it, for, for, uh, it might have been the choreography or something. No, I think it, it did get a, a did dong it? for the yeah, soundtrack. Well, that's good. Indeed. Um, it was a hell of a film. I liked, I liked it. I, I, I don't think it got the treatment it should have got. I agree. Uh, Max Collin gave a fantastic performance. Yeah, I thought it was a good movie. It, it seemed to have, they, you know, they threw it in the theatres and didn't leave it there long enough. Mm. It was there for a week or something, you know, yeah. and then they took it out, you know. It was, and uh, it was not given the chance to, to take off. And because mm. uh, we were hoping it was going to be like a mural's wedding or something, you know, yes. up there and money, money, money. It, as well. it had every potential. <laughs> it was a lovely story. It was well. Yeah, it was, I thought it was a good idea. It was written by Dennis Whitburn, who's a good friend of you know, mine and a uh, really good uh, script writer and everything. And um, it should have it should have done better. Mm. And uh, it's it actually is on cable in the USA mm -hmm. and places like that. And it's still being shown, so... Um, yeah, uh, um, it's easily readily available online, mm. so I do recommend, if you can uh, find, track it down, Billy's Holiday, great film, you'll like it. Now, Doug, um, throughout your career, uh, now, especially in the 70s, um, you've dealt with quite a few record labels, and that was the day where the record labels wielded a lot of power. What was it like dealing with them? Well, uh, yeah, you're right. It's a whole different ball game. To now, it was okay. Um, uh, Production-wise, we were pretty well in control of what we did. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, especially with publishing, it was more more of a problem mm -hmm. because when we were in America, we were kind of desperate to get a publishing contract because we were sort of, you know, we were staying in a hotel and we were worried about in Nashville how to kind of pay the bills. Yeah. <laughs> So we managed to get a publishing contract, but of course they throw it in front of you and um, it's a life of copyright kind of thing. I kind of locked Winter in America away for like 70 years or something. Wow. You know, so, yeah. and, uh, and the percentages weren't as good as they could be. So, you know, that, that, that's what happens. But now, mm. of course, it's a whole different... The music business is just... Artists are a lot more protected these days. Well, it's just different. I mean, mm. most of the young artists now uh, a lot of them aren't signed to any. Label. Yes, they're self-releasing. They're self-releasing. They don't need to worry about um, 
publishing companies and um, they don't need to worry about record companies. They just self-release and... and Set it, up a YouTube channel yeah, and away they go. Right. And, you know, it's inconceivable from our time to um, envisage getting 200 million people, you know, <laughs> yeah. watching like a Justin Bieber clip or something, you know. Yeah. Um, that, that would be indescribable back then. You know, yeah, not even Elvis was getting that done. No, because when I recorded, you had no choice. You had to record in a studio because mm. you couldn't record at home no. with, um, you know, Pro Tools and all that stuff like you mm. can now. You can buy that and in your bedroom you can make a record. But you, or you can produce you know, pretty much anything at yeah, home, even yeah. a television show. Yeah, you can't, uh, you couldn't do that then, of course. You had to go mm. into a recording studio and... I think what it did do, though, was you had to be good enough to do that, in a way. Well, this raises a point, actually. Um, I've quite often been of the opinion that um, some of these days, uh, some of the musicians these days, what they're robbed of is the opportunity to pay their dues. That's true. And, and more so because of probably those talent shows on yes. TV. Um, the kind of feel is that you don't work your way up, th you know, through the pubs anymore. Well, that's and right. The They're not trading the boards. Yeah, doing it's gigs like it's, that um, you know, um, yeah, that's all changed. But look, I'm too long in the tooth to criticise mm. the way the music business is now. Yeah. Because, you know, when I was starting off, I liked... Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis Presley and my mother and father hated that, you know, because yeah. the devil's music. <laughs> and um, I suppose generation changes, you know, and now I I hate hip-hop and I mm. can't stand it and the doof-doof, you know. But it's because I'm a different generation to the people Things who listen to it. Yeah. I even find that myself. I mean, I'm, I'm younger than yourself, but I still find myself longing for the, how things were when I grew up. Mm. Yeah. And uh, missing. Well, I think a lot of melodies gone out of. Uh, I agree. Gone out of music, and uh, a lot of um, uh, you've got auto tune now, where mm. voices can be fixed up, and anybody who wants to make a record can, even if they can't sing. You know, it's a, it's it's just amazing. And, <laughs> and I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it in the old days, if you know, you had to do it straight to tape. You yeah. know, it was like there was no auto-tune or Pro Tools and e easy editing. I mean, a lot of times you'd be s splicing tape, you know, cutting tape into pieces and stuff. And mm. a whole different ball game. You were once quoted as um, saying that you had um, eaten and drank a lot of American breakfasts. Oh, yeah, well, that, that's true in Nashville, yeah. 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 Uh, I, well, yeah, I used to love the breakfasts in Nashville because they were like... They had um, really good hickory smoked bacon and Ooh. eggs and uh, they even had grits. I couldn't handle grits. I wasn't into grits. <laughs> Americans <laughs> do do breakfast very well. Oh, right, it was though. great. And hamburgers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I miss uh, Arby's beef burger. I used to love that. Arby's, they sort of like little thin pieces of beef. But Arby's, was the whole right? chain is like McDonald's. <laughs> but I, they don't have it in Australia, unfortunately. Mm. Any regrets? What, over the years? Oh, yeah. God, yes. Well, I guess maybe, but I look at myself now and I think how lucky I am to have got a back catalogue mm. which is respected mm -hmm. and a career that's been respected and I have never intentionally like hurt anybody in the business. Therefore, I think I've gain that respect to people. I can look back on a career and I don't really have any regrets about it. I mean, mm. maybe signing a couple of contracts. contracts yeah, yeah, well, yeah. you know, that, that weren't really trying to rip me off. It was just the way they were done, you know. Yeah, um, yeah I'd like to have that back again and mm. look at them and go, oh, wow, no, no thanks, you know. But uh, overall, I've been very lucky. I've met some great musicians, played with some great musicians. I've, done supports for people Some of the biggest names in the like business. Like Joni Mitchell and, um, uh, you know, I'm mates with a lot of good people, you know, and mm. it really, uh, it really, it, it's been a great life.
they freed the noise There were scarlet coated boys Marching down the village thoroughfare We were there, weren't we brother? I've written some really good songs with um, other people. Well, in, in, in case in point, and the black band played Waltzing Matilda. Yeah, I sang Eric, Eric's song. What a great song. Now, that yeah, is I know. Well, such a, an iconic a, Australian song. Absolutely brilliant song. song. Brings and, a uh, tear to the eye. <coughs> I know. And that was a weird reason I recorded that, was Michael Park... Did Michael Parkinson? Is it Michael Parkinson? Yes. Yeah. I've got the name right. <laughs> um, <coughs> he was doing his show in Australia. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, they asked me to do the band play Boston and Matilda on the show. And I sang it, and I looked at an idiot, idiot sheet, because it was, look, the lyrics are just so, you know, there's mm. no re re repetition at all, yeah. And I, I kind of sang it with the band and everything, and it sounded great. And they had this wonderful film clips behind me of all people marching. and It was so good, we, we approached CBS Records and said, look, why can we put this out as a single? So they bought the rights from Channel 10 of the actual performance, and that's what we put out. Right. And it got to the top of the charts in Queensland, I think, in a couple of places. And, and it's still beloved today. Yeah, the actual version I did um, is kind of Eric. I think Eric actually likes it himself. You know, yeah. he, he comments on the fact that, yeah, it's great. Indeed. You know. When I was a young man, the free life of a rover Murray's green basin to the dusty outback I lost my Matilda all over Then in 1915 the country sits up It's time to stop roving, there's work to be done So they gave me a tin hat and they gave me a gun And they sent me away to the war and the band played waltzing Matilda As a ship pulled away from the quay And I missed all the cheers, the flag waving and tears We set off for Gallipoli How well I remember that terrible day How our blood stained the sand and the water And how in that hell that they called Silver Bay we were butchered like lambs at the slaughter Johnny Turkey was waiting, he primed himself well Shot us with bullets and rained us with shell And in five minutes flat, well he blown us to hell He nearly blew us right back to Australia And the band played waltz and Matilda As we stopped to bury our slain Buried out, the Turks buried dead And we started all over again So those who were left just tried to survive In a mad world of blood, death and fire And for ten weary weeks I kept myself alive As around me the corpses piled high Then a big Turkish shell knocked me ass over it up in the hospital bed I saw what it had done and I wished I was dead And I knew there were worse things than dying Where I'll go no more was in the till All around the green bush far and free Mr. the hunt and ten feet A man needs both legs No more waltz in the till All back to Australia The legless, the armless, the blind and insane The grey wounded heroes of silver And as our ship pulled in at circular key I looked at the place where me legs used to be I thank Christ there was nobody waiting for me To mourn and to grieve and to pity And the band played waltzing the 
detective As they carried us down the gangway Nobody cheered, they just stood there and stood Turned all their faces away So now, every April I sit on me porch Watch the parade pass before me See my old comrades, how proudly they march Reviving old dreams and past glory But the old men march slowly, old bones, stiff and sore The tired old men from a tired old war And the young people ask, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question When the band plays waltz in the till The old men answer the call Year after year, more old men disappear Soon no one will march there at all Well, just lastly, um, for those coming along now, would you have any advice for them? I, 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 I would say um, not really, because it's a whole different world. Everyone has to take their own journey. Yeah, it's, and it's a different world. You know, I know some, I'm friends with some younger artists, you know, really great artists from Adelaide, like, um, for just mention two, The Yearlings. Yes. Uh, Kelly Menhennet. Yeah. Uh, who's absolutely brilliant voice mm. and uh, uh, love them, you know. But I don't know what advice I could give them. I mean, they're doing the right thing. They're doing, they're doing what they want to do, you know. And um, Well, that's the advice we were given in the 60s. Do what you want to do, yeah. be what you want to be. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, I think, it, you know, it's up to them what they do. I'd be just wary of signing anything, you know. Like, yeah. like, not that they're probably ever going to have to. Now. You can take to heart that um, the one good thing about the internet, digital technology, is that your legacy will be preserved forever and continue to influence and touch people. I, I, oh, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, I see that that is the way it's going to be because you can get anything now on YouTube and stuff. My stuff's on YouTube, but it's all there, you know. And uh, I haven't had the five million views of Winter in America, but I think I've had about 137,000. So that's, that's certainly all respectable. Right. That's not bad. Yeah, for well, thanks bloke. very much. For <laughs> thanks very much for talking with us it's today, been a Doug. Pleasure, Jeff. Indeed. Yeah.